Welcome to the podcast. Today we're here with authentic falconer Peter Stavriano Dacus. Stavriano Dacus. Okay, I'll only butcher it one or two more times. Wouldn't be um, the first. <laughs> Peter is a, a defense attorney here in Modesto, um, California, and he's also the president of a nonprofit, American Falconry Conservancy. One other thing, kind of a major thing you might have uh, recognized from, he's in litigation. He's currently um, suing the government and violating uh, Fourth Amendment rights that every falconer is being violated right now just to have that permit. So we are going to jump into that and unpack into that a little bit later. Um, but first, I want to kind of get to know Peter and have him start off um, his journey in falconry from the very beginning. In the beginning. In the beginning. Well, it starts out like almost everyone's. You watch falcons or hawks fly and you just, I just became enamored watching these, what I thought, gigantic birds, watching my first red tail take off and scream out of the sky. And uh, as a kid, um, I say kid because I'm an old man now, about 16, uh, I was working orchards, walnut well, orchards, and uh, came upon an injured kestrel and picked it up, took it home. And uh, I hung a branch from the ceiling of my bedroom and this little kestrel and I, uh, we hit it off and it wasn't long after that I was out catching grasshoppers on the gravel in front of my mom's <laughs> house and knew nothing about falconry. Absolutely nothing other than these birds catch stuff. Yeah. And uh, I had a, a relative, a second cousin, Frank DiBartolo, uh, lived in the Bay Area, San Jose, and he actually had a hawk. He was a licensed falconer. I never knew this. But my mom told him, and uh, he sent me my first falconry book, uh, Mitchell's. And uh, I started reading and learning that you don't feed kestrels hot dogs. <laughs> Though they were really good tidbitting technique as, yeah. a, as a kid. <laughs> and after a couple years of actually getting into falconry by you know having this bird and then uh, coming across others, uh, I learned that you had to get a license. Big surprise. Yeah. And so, uh, how old were you at this time? I'm now about 19. Oh, okay. So yeah, I played with it for a while before I knew mm -hmm. this is back in the seventies and nobody was really looking out for a little kid with a Kestrel. So yeah, didn't really worry about it much. Well, I didn't worry about it cause I didn't know anything wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then went out, uh, on that, on that adventure, finding a sponsor, looking for people very very different scenario than it is today. I could imagine. How so? Well, Falconry was a, uh, a very tight-lipped and close-knit community of, of individuals, mm -hmm. not groups. Falconry was not, and whatever really never was, a, a group sport. And I went through lists and found uh, a Falconry book here, a, a California Hawking Club magazine, an old paper stapled together uh, journal and in it had a list of a couple of members and from that I went on uh, my search and found uh, I just got really lucky the very first guy I found uh, was Richard Lawson Dick Lawson and he's a great guy and we still communicate to this day and he said well he lived up in Farmington he goes well if you want to come out and you know we'll talk and so I drove up and I had a little 914 Porsche and I got out of the car and he looked at me and he goes, okay, let's go. And he took his Tursa Gossack out and we went down the railroad tracks and up to this Jack and it took after it, we took after them and, and, uh, we talked for a bit and he goes, oh no, he goes, no, I'm going to sponsor you. And, uh, Years later, he told me why, and he just said, well, most guys want to get into falconry. You know, they might see me and find me and come out. You know, they're driving some broken down car. You know, they're not even, you know, they're ever going to pay the money for a license or a permit, let alone build a muse. Oh, okay. And you came in here, you had your, you know, your act together. And, yeah. and I said, this is the guy that's going to actually do something. And, you know. That's great. We've been friends uh, ever since. And that's funny. His first reaction was he kind of gave you like a 
pre-qualification to see if you can afford falconry. <laughs> well, he wanted to just check it out. Is yeah. this guy am I is this guy worth wasting my time? Yeah. And, and then I'm we sure. learned I you know, I came all the way out just to hang out with him and Hawk and I'm sure you uh, you'd have to be deaf dumb and blind not to sense my excitement. Yeah. Okay. And the intensity. <clears throat> I and so uh, and he was great because yeah. he was pretty much hands off. Okay. If I had a question, he'd ask me. Um, he wasn't a dictatorial yeah. type of a, a person who's trying to control what you do and how every how every move you make must be just a their specifications. Because um, I think when he started, there probably weren't very many rules or laws or oh, okay. things of that nature. Because it was he had some years on me, and uh, I hope I'm still kicking like he is. <laughs> but he's a great guy, and and. Uh, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. So that you still have a good relationship with him, you said. Is oh. he still hawking or is he He's not. Uh, he came he's had a couple of difficulties health-wise and oh, okay. Not going into any details about my friend's personal life. Uh, yeah. He said I just don't think I'll be able to do what it takes to uh to fly yeah. a hawk. Okay. Well, yeah. It is what it is, but that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, you, but we're still you in touch that. and he still likes to hear the stories and yeah, I asks about all the old guys that, that uh, he introduced me to and then, mm -hmm. and I hung around with great um, guy. So he had a goshawk on your first flight. Didn't that kind of spoil it for you? That's like one of the like most exciting birds to see chase and that you can't fly a goss until, well, I don't know. What were the regs back then? The Could regs you fly back then were, it was still red tail kestrel. Okay. Yeah. It was still. You know, you have to drive a pig before you can ride a horse, which yeah. is ridiculous. And I'm not taking anything against kestrels or red tails. I loved flying my little kestrel when I had them, and yeah. and uh, I had a ball with red tails. I had an absolute ball with them. But uh, there are some crazy little notions about, well, these are the only two birds you can fly when what we should be telling people is, what kind of game do you have in your area? Can you find a bird, a mm. hawk, that is there that can catch the game you have sure yeah. not here's the hawk you have to have now go find the game whether it's 100 miles away or not yeah it's, uh, ridiculous it's ridiculous like, you're absolutely right it's like making up the rules and setting it in every different scenario and expecting everyone to follow that but that but yeah. that's uh there was a time i guess when people had the same notions of his royalty you know and eagle for the emperor and a jeer for the king <laughs> and a paragon to his Hooker, I don't know. <laughs> so when it comes right okay. down to it, there's always been this hierarchy of what bird uh -huh. you can have and what status you can have with the bird, and yeah. and there's just really no place for that kind of elitism in in America, let alone <laughs> falconry. But, Amen. But it's there. I, I agree with you on that 100. percent So your first bird was a um, kestrel. Kestrel, yes. Right on. And then you moved on to a, a red tail. A red tail. Well, I, I could say moved on, but it's like I'd already flown kestrels, and it came to, time to get a license. Mm -hmm. You know, and after watching, you know, Dick's bird, you know, just tear after that jack. Yeah. Uh, then uh, red tail seemed like to be the most likely bird for me in it. And okay. I had fun with them. Yeah. There right. were jackrabbits here then. It was fun. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, now, a lot of sponsors were, are, like you just said, your sponsor is more of like a hands-off, let you make your own mistakes and then correct you, I'm, I'm guessing, right? Well, I didn't make as many mistakes as I could have. Because I listened. <laughs> okay. And that was my next question. Yeah, what What yeah. is it that stuck like that he told you that just like carried on with you um, as far as falconry advice or direction? I think the most important advice he ever gave me is that no matter what, the bird comes first. Mm -hmm. The health of the bird comes first over your wants. That getting a bird super sharp so it'll chase and tear after something is not as important as you maintaining a healthy bird. Because a healthy, strong bird will catch things. Yeah. And uh, the idea of a bird dying on you And it's is the right horrible. thing to do. You're it's right. It's the right yeah. thing to do. It is the right thing to do. A lot of people get caught up. And uh, he also impressed upon me the time. It's like, if you're not going to spend the time, then maybe this isn't for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the and at the time, that was a huge consideration for me. I was young. I was uh, just opened a, a hair salon. I had a, a farming little operation. I was sharecropping. Uh, I, there was all kinds of little things I was doing that mm -hmm. to keep myself employed that took time, but every one of them also gave me my own freedoms for my out time, and and I got to spend that hawking and yeah, 
and that was good. Yeah, definitely important. Um, I wanted to ask, what is like the most memorable mo- moment from uh, someone else's flight, your flight, just in falconry in general? Like, what is the most the awesomest scene that you can recall of pursuit? Okay, uh, then this was through my sponsor, through mm-hmm. Dick. There's a gentleman, and a lot of you old timers will, will just like to hear the name again, but Doug Carmine. Uh, and he was an amazing falconer. He had two falcons, and he had bird, and he had new bird. He had two birds, and one was new bird. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were out over uh, between Stockton and Farmington areas at some ponds, and he sent his peregrine up, and I just watched it go, and I just, wait a minute, this is like in the storybooks. You, you read about how these people did this, and this actually is now happening before me. The bird just rung straight up over the pond. There were five or six ducks on it, uh, mallards, mm-hmm. and that thing went up. I I had no idea of estimating heights at the time, but they told me, and I believed them because they don't have a reason to lie. Mm-hmm. About twelve hundred feet, the mm-hmm. bird goes up really high. Yeah, and then we flush these birds, and this bird just straight down vertical. There is not 91 degrees, not 89 degrees, just dropped out of the sky. It smashes this duck, and we were maybe 80 feet, 90 feet away from the impact point. Yeah. And it smashed it, pulled straight up, and I guess this went about 300 feet without beating a wing, Mm -hmm. and came back down and took a second bird. Oh, my gosh. And... (laughs) You know, you stand there, you know, your jaw's like this, and yeah, and and for Doug, it was like, yeah, he's a good bird. <laughs> Just <laughs> no expression. As humble is, yeah. Well, I don't always get. I mean, doubles is rare, but you know, that's how he flies. You know, and if there's another bird to get, I get he's gonna get it. <laughs> and um, that's incredible. And I've seen some great flights before, but that one, it was. Okay, I watched that. Now, how do you ever get that again? And, and I've never seen that again. I, yeah, I have never seen like a really close um, peregrine smacking a duck or it, anything it's, like that. It's like the duck was going to fly towards us. I don't know what was going on, but it just, it came off the water and it wasn't the first one off the water. But when it came up, yeah, it was just. So after that, did that give you the itch to try and start switching over to peregrines or? Well, I knew I wouldn't be able to get a peregrine. Um, for one, there was no way I could trap one. And two, uh, I didn't have the money to buy one. Oh, okay. And uh, and I always liked the idea of trapping. There's something about taking a bird from nature, mm-hmm. flying it, and returning it back to nature, that something about that, about that resonated with me. Yeah. And so that began the uh, probably my course of legal actions – that we'll talk about later and yeah and uh, affected my profession you know it was a public defender mm-hmm. you know, worked for the county paying for not paying for but working for people that can't pay for their services uh, and uh, just picking up on okay helping out the little guy that's getting beaten up or bullied yeah but uh yeah i did want to fly long wings after that i did okay. uh now let's move on to your current bird you have an oplomato Yes, I fly, I fly a little long wing now. You have a long wing. Um, and uh, it's not flown in you know, the traditional long wing sense. I'm, okay. uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Aplomatos, they're more of a chase bird than a stoop bird. Mm-hmm. Though they will take a pitch, and this one waits on for me just you know, 50 feet, 70 feet over my head. Okay. It just hovers around me waiting for the next chase mm-hmm. versus the big stoop and dive. Uh, and he's just a kick. I've had him for uh, four years now, and uh, he was an imprint bird, single oh, yeah. imprint. Mm-hmm. So uh, he was just a wonderful little guy. Where'd you pull him, him from? Was Pardon? He, where'd you pull him from here? Well, in uh, this bird was actually uh, captive bred in Santa Cruz. Oh, okay. Uh, Bill Murphy had him for the first ten days. Uh, Hatchet had him for. Oh, he's the one that bred the birds, and then. Gosh, this is horrible. I can't think of the gentleman's name. And he was amazing that uh, I've never met him. That's why I don't, can't think of his name. But he actually did the imprinting. He was going to fly him and changed his mind. And 
Okay. I, I got a bird that was all the places where I would have probably messed up and had nasty habits mm -hmm. were taken care of by a pro. <laughs> yeah. That's... And so very fortunate. Very fortunate he's still alive. It's yeah. it's hard to keep male oplos from being attacked by something else. I know that very well. He and used to fly uh, them. I've had a lot of friends of mine who just flat out told me, oh, well, don't get too attached and uh, yeah. scared my wife to death. Oh, yeah, that's hot candy. Uh -huh. You're flying candy. No. <laughs> um, what, but, is he, uh, what does he fly at? Uh, about 245 okay. is, is a good weight for him. I've flown him as high as 270 where mm -hmm. he's not really responsive. He still chases things. He's just not responsive to me. Uh, sure. Uh, but he's not – he's far from – week is as low as 230 i've flown in different ranges and i've had a lot of falconers with more experience than me say you're flying him too high you're oh, going to okay. do better if you fly him a little bit lower uh and they're probably right sure but i used to go back to dick yeah saying you know you keep and, a strong healthy bird and you'll have a bird for a, a long time yeah and Everyone's priorities are different too. So, what is your oh, yeah. priority? Do you want to catch game every single time, or do you want to have a good time and have a healthy bird or a longer life? I uh, there's always a balance, but for me, I enjoy watching the bird fly. Mm -hmm. Even if he doesn't catch anything, I'm not disappointed. Yeah. Some people are, you know, brag about the bag or, you know, what how much they cook. You know that that term brag yeah. about the bag, but uh, I've never really been that way. Yeah. And for a lot of hawking, you know, instead of multiple takes, I'm not downing or dissing anyone that likes to go out and catch multiple heads of game every day if they can, because that's mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. But um, I'm pretty much a one and done with with my birds. I okay. want my birds to get their exercise. I want them to have a good time. I want to have a good time. And if it's successful at the end of the day with something in the bag, then then great. Yeah. And if I leave one today so I can catch it again tomorrow, Okay. I'm happy. <laughs> uh, so did you originally, pre-Notion, before you found this perfect opportunity, were you already looking for Oplos, or was that Actually, just... my, I was, again, this has to do with just being a cheap Greek. I was going to go trap a Merlin. <laughs> a I wanted Greek. a small falcon. I decided that, um, one, I didn't want to drive all day long looking for game. So there are always small birds around our area. I had okay. lots of open alfalfa fields to fly in. Uh, and that seemed to be the style of hawking I wanted to do. And then this Oplo just materialized, and I just snatched it just instantly. And it's the first time I've ever spent more than $300 for a bird. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you are a thrifty falconer. That's I, like impossible now, to do. spent money on gear, that's yeah. different. But, uh -huh. but uh, that was... Uh, Nothing wrong with that. I mean, plenty of wild birds out there for... For free, right? Well, it still it's, cost you, but yeah. sometimes trapping can be more money than buying. Yeah, but I, uh, I've always liked trapping. I think it's a kick, um, but I haven't had to for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a, a one bird falconer. I've tried to, and and I, this is also an old adage. There was a time when uh, one falconer, one wife, two falcons, no wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know, I have priorities too. My family's important. Yeah. And so I wasn't going to be spending all of my free time out in fields or trapping or chasing. So go, go through um, just your training regimen or your, right before you're going out to hunt. Like, what does it look like um, as uh, far it's, as? It's really fast. Yeah. My bird and I, we just, we got a little thing going and I just pick him up, slap on a transmitter. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure I have something in the bag to bring him back with my lure, mm -hmm. some meat, and away we go. Sometimes, uh, lately, I've been taking my Britneys, which love running in alfalfa fields. Okay. And um, they have not been properly trained. They are just <laughs> fun. But it's amazing just by running around like chickens with their heads cut off, how many birds they kick up. Yeah. And and my falcon, Al, he stoops my my dogs. Mm -hmm. Can't get him to stoop to a lure, but he'll stoop a dog, and he, no problem. But he knows the birds are coming up around him, and so when they're not doing anything or getting what he wants, he'll just fly over and take a pot shot out of it. Yeah. And then fly back over again and wait. But It's really funny how the dogs um, 
falconry and the dog relationship, like the birds pick up on that pretty quickly. And they just follow the dogs because they know that's the source. That's where they're coming from. And, well, the crazy thing is, is they're bird dogs. Mm -hmm. And the hierarchy of, of all other types of hunting, it's man, dog, bird. And the dogs respect you, but they're after that bird. Yeah. But your hawk, it's sometimes me, sometimes the bird. <laughs> uh -huh. But the, ha the dog is always at the end of that train. And the hawk is always above it because they respect the hawk. Yeah. And it's one thing for you if you have a, you know, a, a big, like a goshawk that could actually do some damage on a snout. Mm -hmm. I've got this little tiny guy that weighs, you know, roughly eight ounces, a half a pound. Yeah. And he's the shot caller. <laughs> so. That's so funny. <laughs> I have a Brittany. They are very sweet dogs. They are. We love ours. Very sweet dogs. And you can yeah. see out here in the river, they spend their afternoons. We come out here and yeah. I sit out in the sand and let them run up and down and splash in the water and when we ride our horses the dogs come with us if it's around the ranch and oh yeah and the dogs gonna, run and i was wondering do you ever um ride horseback and fly your bird I know i've some tried it my that. hawk does not like my horses oh, okay there's something i mean it's a huge animal yeah and so that was one of the things i was going to do and there are people Famous people, yeah, Harry that, that do it. and yeah. I probably didn't start that young, young falcon out on the horse. And if I was going to do it over again, I probably would have spent some of those first months just riding. And I've done it; I've taken him out and ride. And he'll sit there, but he won't come back with me on the horse. Okay. And then there's also the complication <laughs> is if you catch something and have to get off the horse, then you've got to worry about a horse. Loose, oh yeah and a bird out and a dog out <laughs> and uh, i didn't even think about that it's whole coordinating new, uh, all the critters yeah dog and a hawk's enough to coordinate dog hog and horse yeah it's i could see i'm not me. that good of a juggler yeah well that makes sense that, gotta have that all dialed in if you're gonna yeah. go um i wanted to jump into um Pacific Legal Foundation is who represents you in yes. the litigation, and it's your case versus um, Fish and Wildlife. And I looked up, it, it was started when January 2019 is when it first opened. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And it's in currently um, ongoing. But the um, basically, you're challenging the government to change the laws that are infringing upon our Fourth Amendment rights. So go ahead and explain into detail better sure. than I so we'll, we'll, there are actually two uh, amendments that we're working on. Okay. We have the free speech amendment, which we'll go into, but the fourth amendment is what brought me to Pacific Legal Foundation. And basically that keeps you free from unwarranted searches and seizures in your home without a warrant. Mm -hmm. And Falconry has this unusual little tag along um, because it was originally a federal permit. And all federal permits back then when falconry began, uh, as far as licensed falconry began, had a clause that if you had a federal permit, you could be inspected without a warrant. And this makes sense because it's like tobacco, alcohol, and firearms. Sure. Well, if you're making guns and ammunition, you might get a random inspection without a warrant. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in the healthcare industry, for example, uh, someone might come inspect your hospital without a warrant to make sure that you're sanitary. Uh, and all anything else that might deal with health. Uh, alcohol goes without saying. If you're distilling spirits, we're going to be able to come in and check and make sure that every every bottle, every ounce is accounted for so they're getting their revenue. Mm -hmm. Well, falconry is a personal thing. It's an individual sport. It has nothing to do with public safety. It has nothing to do with making sure that the world is free from people making illegal alcohol or building bombs. Yeah. Uh, but... Because that little caveat, all federal permits require inspection, it attached onto falconry. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that attaching on, there were some in falconry in the beginnings that also, we have nothing to hide and to keep our port sport pure, you can come into my home anytime you want and see what a wonderful man I am or woman, but I'm sure it was men at the time. Yeah. Probably white men, probably rich <laughs> white men. Um, but that's how that came about. And then uh, the feds gave it over to the states when they gave up the permitting process. But the states glammed on to that chance to get into our houses without a warrant. Mm -hmm. And so that's 
the the basis yeah. for the the that part of the lawsuit, and then I had a, a personal interaction of a search without a warrant, which I was arrested, handcuffed, thrown in a game warden's car, and that also had to deal with my love for long wings because mm -hmm. when I became a general, I decided to get a permit to trap a prairie falcon out of Nevada. Okay. And Celeste Cushman, which is a game warden's name that only old, old time falconers will know, um, issued me a permit, gave me a letter to go to Nevada because wow. I wasn't a general let yet. Uh -huh. And then uh, as soon as I became a general, which was just moments before the trapping season was going to end, I already had my Nevada license hunting, Nevada uh, falconry license, Nevada trapping permit, uh, banned for a Nevada prairie falcon, export mm -hmm. permit so I could take it out of the state of Nevada. Mm -hmm. And when I asked for my import permit, Celeste Cushman said, we don't issue you the permit until you have the bird. Okay. And I didn't know any better. Uh -huh. And so I trapped the bird, had a game warden in Nevada ban the bird had all my permits in place, called California, Sacramento. Uh, I have my bird now. I'd like to bring it to the States. I need my import permit. said, it's okay. Bring it on in and we'll send, get your permit. Sure. So I come in. And after about three weeks of multiple phone calls, my permit's not here yet. Uh, they sent a game warden. Said I had illegally transported the state lines and brought a falcon across the state lines with a penalty of $25,000 in five years in federal prison. Whoa. So um, that's how that, that all began, all without a warrant. Mm -hmm. Was it the Utah Game and Warden that came? It was California. Over? It was California that Yeah, because Nevada imposed. was happy with me bringing it over because I had an export permit. But oh, okay. the import permit, the one that allows it into the state, oh, I see. didn't. Okay. And that was withheld on purpose. And uh, fortunately, they had no evidence that I had done such a thing. Mm -hmm. And this is before you were involved in law, right? Oh, way before. Yeah. Way before. So do you think that kind of steered you in the direction of where you're at now? It helped because right then I knew that law enforcement has powers. Yeah. And they exceed which is just the nature of the beast. You always exceed the power you have, hoping you can get a little more. But um, fish and wildlife is notorious for thinking they're above the law, mm -hmm. that they are the law. And I've repeatedly seen this type of behavior. Mm -hmm. In fact, the game warden that arrested me used to bring hawks to my house to rehab because he didn't want to mess with them. Really? So I was on a one-on-one, -on -one, hey, what's going on? How are you doing basis? Mm -hmm. Well, it's like, what did you bring for me to feed today? That kind of a thing. And he brought over handcuffs. Oh, my gosh. Wow. And that's um, another thing. When you started this um, litigation, I heard about it, but I didn't know too much about the detail. But I heard from other falconers at Falconry Meets just the kind of overall feel, and they're like, they wanted to stay out of harm's way. They didn't want to ruffle any feathers. They don't want to be the next target. Um, so a lot of people kind of distance, distance themselves from the whole um, litigation. Oh, and me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can imagine you as well. <laughs> That's okay. You... Lovers, haters, I don't care. Bottom line, we're all going to benefit when this is over. Yeah. That's just, and uh, I didn't do it for thanks and pats on the back. I did yeah. it because it's the right thing. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. And, um, the, uh, the other thing that I saw in the lawsuit, it also affects your wife because you're married. They're infringing on her rights just because she married a falconer. That, that's exactly correct. Um, Katie's also, Catherine's a plaintiff in the case. Here I, uh, not voluntarily, it's either sign this document or we take your bird away, um, are you know, essentially, in, in the eyes of this law, have forced to give up a constitutional right to get a permit, which is illegal. That in and of itself is illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, but my wife never signed such papers. She isn't a falconer. But if I'm not home, that's her house too. And she has no protections from fish and wildlife because they don't think that the Constitution applies to anyone who lives 
with the falconer. Mm -hmm. So, and that's no way to live, wondering, the, yeah. you know, who's the next person going to knock on your door. Yeah. So, uh, and are they going to be armed? And for those of you that watched the video, you'll, you would have seen Fred Seaman, what happened to him. Mm -hmm. Three armed guards, you know, three armed game wardens come in. One demands him out of the house, then blocks the front door so he can't even get back into his own home. And they keep him out in his underwear for 45 minutes. Bulletproof best to do an inspection? Hmm. Armed to the teeth to do an inspection? You need a clipboard and a pencil to do an inspection. Yeah. All without a warrant. And didn't he schedule an inspection with them? They called to schedule it? On that date, uh, when you move facilities or change facilities, you're supposed to say, I've relocated. Come look at the same stuff I had at my old house at the new house. Mm -hmm. And so he had actually called in, set up an inspection. And instead of coming down the day of the inspection, they came down the morning before, uh, okay. broken a locked gate, came onto his property, coerced him out of his house, kept mm -hmm. him from going back into his house, and then uh, finally uh, allowed him the chance to put on a pair of pants and take some necessary medication and and then uh, wow. go on with the inspection. Yeah. Um, there was another thing I noticed in there, um, and it was kind of the the wording. It said that you were also, um, the government regulates falconer speech. And I kind of understood but didn't. I wanted to ask for elaboration on that. Well, if you give a talk about falconry, mm -hmm. uh, a falconry exhibition per se, go to a school, go to a Boy Scout, Girl Scout, little organization, someone asks you to speak about your bird and bring it and show it to some kids. Yeah. There are requirements of things the government tells you, you must say inside your educational program. Okay. Uh, specifics about, you know, falconry and their care and their protected status and all these different things. Then they prohibit you from collecting a fee for that. So, if you travel 100 miles, you could write off your mileage and get that reimbursed. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, you stayed for a couple days, none of that's can be recompensated. So that's, oh, it's wow. illegal. And then um, you can't use your bird in any movies unless the movie's a falconry movie. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, or you have an extra entertainment permit, which is a whole other Issue. Well, even then. Oh, even then. Even then, because if the bird falls under any of the species that the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, affects, that's the MBTV, MBTA yep. affects, then if those birds are affected, you can't use those birds. Mm -hmm. um, the one that comes to mind most often is uh, Falcon and the Snowman. Well, Falcon's in the title. Yeah. But they couldn't shoot the falconry scenes in the United States. They had to go trap a prairie falcon in Mexico and shoot those film those sequences in Mexico. I had no idea. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> it's like, here, I have a prairie falcon. Can we film my bird? Oh, no, you can't. Well, can I go to Mexico and film it? Well, yeah, if you, it's, if you use a Mexican falcon. So there's still hawks and falcons and birds. There's still eagles in movies and, and different clips. And, but where, where are they from? They're not from the U.S., and they're filmed out of state. So we have a treaty with Canada and Mexico that these birds that fly through the Pacific Flyway and all the other ways that travel across the Americas uh, to make sure that those birds are protected. So the same bird that we're protecting in the Migratory Bird Treaty Act by this supposed free speech impingement, it's okay to use that bird in Canada. It's okay to use that bird in Mexico but it's dangerous to the bird to film it in the United States because that middle section is, oh my God, falcons just die instantly if they were filmed in a movie there. What could possibly be the reasoning? Like what, who would stand to gain anything from that logic? Nobody, but it's a restriction. Just poorly written. Uh, I think, at, again, at the time when a lot of these regulations were, were made, there are people that believe, and I, I still believe in part of this, that falconry is the pursuit of game with a bird of prey. And that's the little definition, and that's the bracket. Okay. And if you do anything outside of that, you've broken some elitist code of falconry. 
I see. Now, if you did that same thing and filmed it, well, if it was a film for falconry, I'm filming how to catch a, a bird. I'm filming my bird in action. Mm -hmm. But if you put that in the context of a movie, <gasps> you've broken the brackets. You've broken the code. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rationale the government uses, which is no rationale, uh, at least in the lawsuit, their answer reply, uh, provided no rationale, was that this will harm the birds. It's for to protect the birds so we won't let anyone exploit them. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is uh, contradictive. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I had some questions from someone um, on Instagram, and he, I wanted me to ask you these things here. So... So he wanted to ask me about if you knew anything about um, the spa permit, the special purpose abatement permit, and how um, abatement um, people cannot use apprentices in certain states um, because supposedly it goes against the, the state laws. I'm not the best versed, but I can share this with you. I, I don't fly abatement birds. I've okay. never uh, had a situation in which I would ever be hired to do so. Though I've used birds to chase uh, things off my own property. That's a different story. Yeah. But there's this concept that an apprentice can only fly these two specific birds. And in yeah. different states, it's different. Alaska used to be able to fly goshawks as an apprentice mm -hmm. because there are more goshawks there than red tails. It's about a quantity and I guess the fishing game department says so what if we lose a red tail to a an apprentice that does know how to feed a bird another one will come along the mortality rate so great and there's so many uh, but the fact is that every state has different rules mm -hmm. about how they want to treat uh, abatement the use of falconry birds for abatement uh, it's not really that logical at all why an apprentice can't fly any bird that his the abatement permit has because mm -hmm. basically you're doing the same thing regardless of what bird it is you're putting a bird up in the air you're watching the birds it chases away whatever uh, uh, predating creatures out there eating your grapes or berries or whatever mm -hmm. that might be and then you're bringing it back yeah so there's there's no real logic to it i mean the um the spa permit is a federal permit and then the states have their own laws so does the states trump whatever the federal permit says? Is that how that works? Well, not necessarily. The restrictiveness of a state law can be greater than that of the feds. Okay. It can't be less than that of the feds. So the feds says oh. you can't do this. Okay, that makes but sense. But you can do all these other things. And the state can say, well, you can't do this, but I'm also gonna prohibit this and this. Okay. It's the, uh, so that's it's what's the restrictiveness. So that's in this specific yes. scenario. And that's not, yeah. spa related that's as Everything. a general rule of law okay you can't be less restrictive than the federal government all right i think the only place where that's actually happened uh is in our marijuana laws because the state the feds restrict completely but states aren't as restrictive um they're just not doing anything about it yeah that makes sense okay um the other question kind of tailing back to um retaliation based off of ruffling, you know, challenging and suing the government. Is there any worry that either state or federal could come back and try and do something, let's just say as drastic as taking falconry away or anything in between? They have flat out threatened that. Really? At meetings that I have been at, where I've gone to commission meetings, uh, Fish and Wildlife for California commission meetings, and they just flat out said, look, we don't have to work with you guys. You've been doing this for a while. We think falconry's cool, basically. But, you know, we could just take falconry away from you. That veiled threat, uh, that bullying type of behavior and comments that are made by people in the uh, upper management of Fish and Wildlife, both the Game Commission and through their enforcement branches, uh, it's just another form of bullying and intimidation. Mm -hmm. And... Could they? Quite frankly, I don't think that they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the feds permitted it. It's permitted under migratory burden. Uh, uh, the MBTA permits it. Uh, and one of the issues is, is that this is a cultural 
activity that is 20 times older than hunting with a gun. Yeah. Think about it. How long has gunpowder been around? How long ago did they carve falcons on fists in the Pharaoh's tomb? Yeah. This is a, a culture and tradition that has passed from not just generations. We're talking millennium. Mm -hmm. And for one agency to say, well, under the Migratory Burden uh, Treaty Act, we're going to take away falconry because we think it's bad for the birds when there's no scientific evidence that falconry has any impact, any negative impact. If anything, we might not even have peregrine falcons alive in this whole continent if it wasn't for the birds, falconers birds, mm -hmm. that were donated to breeding projects for re-release into the wild. Yeah. Or yeah. the eggs that were snatched out from wild birds with eggshells too thin to survive that were replaced with captive bred birds that were falconers birds because nobody else was breeding them but falconers. Mm -hmm. So to reintroduce into the wild what might have been lost and to say you can't have it, thank you for reintroducing it, you can't have it again, when there's yeah. absolutely zero, zero impact is just ludicrous. Yeah, falconry does a lot of good for the sport and for just – the environment as far as keeping birds alive helping people uh, i'm sure you got introduced by falconry helping a bird that was injured it happens and uh you know it's the good nature it's the people that are intrigued that take the time and the detail to uh to try and help them so and, and to make yeah. people aware absolutely yeah i mean even the the rodent sides that we use so commonly mm -hmm. you know the impact yes well so your gopher died but you just killed that nesting pair of red tails because they carried up tainted meat to their nest yep. that kind of awareness of the ultimate impact of what we do here if you don't have that poster child which is the pretty bird that you just killed versus the dead rat which everyone wants to see gone yeah if you don't have anything something to balance that out the environment loses mm -hmm. um i wanted to ask you let's say you win the litigation what exactly is your ideal outcome of um, the um, closing this case? Oh, there are, well, there are two aspects of it. The first is that they just simply strike the unconstitutional language in the regulations. They don't have to rewrite them. They just put a blue line right through unannounced inspections. Mm -hmm. Now, they have the right to an inspect a property where you're going to be housing a bird. Well, if I'm filling out a permit and say, okay, I want a permit for this, and the government says, well, I want to make sure you have the proper facilities for it before I give you that permit. There's a nexus there, some justifiability there. Yeah. But they don't come to your house and say, gee, I understand you want to get a dog. I want to come into your house and make sure you have a water dish, a food dish, a blanket for it to sleep on a fenced in enclosure area and a collar and a leash. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't show me that, let me come into your house. I'm not looking to have you dot let you have that dog or that cat. Well, people would be up in arms about even that part of an inspection. Definitely. But what difference is it? I have a dog. The dog chases birds. I have a bird. The bird chases birds. They're both in my house. They're both my pets. I know that'll cause a lot of angst with falconers, but let's face it. <laughs> if you're keeping an animal and you're stroking the feathers on that animal and you're feeding that animal, <clears throat> even though it's a hunting animal. Sure. Um, it's just a, it's just a name that makes some people cringe, but I don't have a problem with it. I love my, my bird. Yeah, people show, I mean, everybody has a, special connection with their falconry bird if you're in falconry you just you're connected with nature one way or the other you and can't help it yeah it's it's incredible that imprinting is cross imprinting let me tell you <laughs> we become in tune to their needs yeah and uh, master and servant i have to tell you those roles interplay mm -hmm. anyone um, who sat underneath the tree and waited till morning for their bird to come down who is the master there <laughs> you know? yeah definitely huh <laughs> yeah um, uh, just to play a little bit of devil's advocate sure. on your, um, 
uh, your last spiel on the, the dogs and the cats. I can see how you can relate them kind of as a broad blanket and say they're pets. Um, but they are specialized if you don't have the proper knowledge and care. I mean, you obviously know we have to get all of these um, licenses and you got to pass tests. So they're not easy to take care of like a dog where you can just throw a bowl and say, yeah, anyone can take care of a dog. So they're, I mean, you're not advocating, obviously, anyone can just have a bird of prey. Um, I'm hoping without the proper education well, and training. Well, that's exactly it. You don't need to take a test to have a pet dog. But there is a test you have to have. You have to have a knowledge base. And if you don't pass that test, Fish and Wildlife, they don't sign off on your ticket. You don't get a bird. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have, right now, a sponsor. That means someone who's willing to say, I will mentor you for two years. I will be there to answer your questions. I will be there to assist you when you need it. I will be here to oversee to make sure that you're doing the right thing by your bird. I mean, you're ultimately responsible. Yep. How many other creatures have that before someone can take possession of them? None that I know of. So the yeah. idea of coming into the house, coming to your property, not the case. Let's look at the other big hunting thing. Okay. How many gun hunters that take a test and do an education program, in fact, falconers take the hunter safety course. I remember that. We yeah. take a hunter safety course for guns without having a gun to shoot. And that's mm -hmm. a prerequisite to take the test for the falconry test. Ridiculous. Yeah. But do you think they come out and say, well, we're going to inspect your home. Do you have a safe place to keep that gun? I mean, guns, you can die from a misused firearm or a misplaced yep. or an unlocked. But there's no inspection for that. And quite frankly, I think Fish and Wildlife is just afraid of people with guns. They're just not afraid of falconers because what are we going to do? Sick our bird on you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not likely. Okay. And we, I think the big power is how much we love our animals. So when they threaten to take away what you love, yeah, it's a huge issue. A huge issue. Uh, I wanted to ask you a couple more questions. We're almost wrapping up here. Sure. Um, and a couple of fun things, maybe some advice. Um, favorite falconry book that you would recommend to people? Could be the first one you have. I, Could be. <laughs> gosh. Or even like, a movie. I like BB's book. I, I really liked him and, and admire that, that guy. What's so. the title of it? Do oh, you remember? I forget. I, it's been so long since I've looked. Looked at a falcon. I, you know, you read something so many times and you just never pick it up again because <laughs> uh, North American falconry. Okay. It was North American falconry. All right. Uh, when I got my first prairie falcon, he had actually autographed uh, a big, oh, awesome. thick book for me. Very cool. Who and is, then, uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You had one more. And then my, the, my, we used to call him Uncle Frank, but my, uh, my second cousin got me my first book. Uh, he had just given me, from, uh, was it King Frederick's book? Ah. <laughs> this is a nice thick book with old, old English terms. Is it, and, is it hard to read? And, I'd imagine it would be like <laughs> it's uh, it's fun to read, but okay. you know I can't find you know uh, Tiger's heart to feed my bird for the oh. special times that. I <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, specialties. Back then, that wasn't uh, on the endangered list. I guess you could just get Tiger's heart yeah. at the market. It, yeah, just go to the store. Yeah. <laughs> um, Favorite falconer of all time that you've been with, that you've known, that you've seen? Maybe you've never met him. Well, he's still alive, so it's really odd that I... <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously my sponsor is, is, is in okay. that group, but um, Bill Murphy is someone that has helped my falconry along immensely. Um, uh, first guy to take me out to Pajaro Dunes and fly my red tail out on Cottontail in the dunes there. And, um, he raised my first Tarasok. You know, he bred my first Tarasok. And he's been just a huge proponent for falconers. Mm -hmm. And he was very supportive of me and, and the things that I've done. And he's just just an overall amazing human being. So, so if he's watching this, um, I'm sure his head won't inflate. His wife will probably give him an elbow. <laughs> uh, but... He'd be on the, in the awesome. top list. Yeah. 
Uh, last question. Um, it's two parts. You might already have your favorite bird. I don't know. But what is your favorite bird to fly or dream bird? And then what do you actually get out of falconry at the end of the day? Why do you do the sport? Well, I love the bird I've had. And I've never had so much fun flying a bird as I've had with my little Loplo Aries. So that's that. But dream bird's a different story. Okay. <laughs> the dream bird I've had in my mind for, got the first time I picked up a book and saw a picture, was I always have wanted an ornate hawk eagle. And oh, I am man. not alone in that. And yeah. it's like, yeah, it's like everybody, you know, wants a Ferrari or whatever. But mm -hmm. but the ornate hawk eagle was the, the bird that just captured me when I first saw a picture. Yeah. And that's it. Um, that's one of my favorites too, actually. Yeah. And so here I'm at a stage now where, gee, I'm living in a state where I can't find a jackrabbit without driving forever. And I want to fly a bird that makes me drive again. <laughs> yeah, so gonna... it might be a dream to some, a nightmare to others. Yeah. <laughs> so Not too many monkey slips for your ornate hawk eagle here. Right? No, 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 not at all. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Peter. I appreciate you, you know, giving me time and, uh, just to share the, you know, your knowledge and wisdom and falconry and, uh, on the legal side as well, which a lot of people probably didn't know the whole story. And I didn't before sitting down with you. Well, thank you for giving me a chance to share a bit with it. Yeah. And, uh, and there's, as again, you mentioned Pacific Legal Foundation. I, and I have it properly thank them. Mm -hmm. These folks came out of nowhere. I uh, literally was looking for the filing papers mm -hmm. against Fish and Wildlife. And is scorping through all these different vast quantities. And with my friend Troy Morris, who is very instrumental, said, hey, these people have taken on fish and game and kicked their ass. Mm -hmm. And I contacted them. And the very first thing they said after I described what was going on, he goes, well, why do you want to do that? That's what we do. And they took the case on. Wow. So, and for free. It's a free foundation that uh -huh. deals with people's rights and especially constitutional rights. Those first 10... They're super important, and we have to fight for them every day. So how can people um, keep up on the status of this um, case? Oh, super easily. Uh, if you go to their website, they also have a Facebook page, Pacific Legal Foundation. If you go onto their webpage, you can see the, the video that was shot uh, that we used uh, to, one, promote the ideals of what this lawsuit stands for. Um, and it's also up for an award, a documentary award, and the Anaheim oh, Awards. Nice. Wow, and I'm film festival in uh, July. And it's so, four and a half minutes of your life. It, <laughs> you're it, the star it'll it'll fly by. Are you the star of that movie too? Oh, the Hawk's the star. Uh, <laughs> awesome. I'm a I'm a supporting actor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't take any pay for that, right? Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Thank glad you, you came all the way out. Hope this. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate it. Stavrion Dacus. Stabian Dykes. That'll get you kicked out of just about anywhere. <laughs> Stabian Dykes. <laughs> <laughs>